Well, it's good to see God's sons and daughters returning. You know, we've had a few a few comments made. Some folks thought this is a little heavy, a little heavy. <laughs> Rabbi's Bible experience this time around is a little heavy. <laughs> Well, that's all right. It's going to get heavier. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's better, you know, it's, it's better to prepare for heavy and be surprised by light and easy. <laughs> you can be promised that in this world you will have many tribulations. And, but I, 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 I just love, I love when, when God gets your attention and makes you like, What? And then he says, but, but, but. I love the buts in scripture because but means, okay, you heard that. However, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. He's like, he's warning us, like, it's gonna get real bad, but rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Why, why? Because I have overcome the world. And, and, and I, I've, I've read that. I remember reading that. And it says, well, good for you, but I'm the one who's stuck over here. <laughs> and at first, it didn't make any sense. It, 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 would, be, it would be kind of like you're going to go and take an exam, and you're really stressed because you, your mind is blanking out. And then and someone comes walking out of the same exam and looks at you and says, the exam is really, really hard. But be of good cheer, I aced it. <laughs> Lord have mercy, like, okay, rub it in, why don't you? Uh, so, so why is he saying this? Because he knows that the trials and tribulations causes to decrease, and when we decrease, he increases in us, and he's already yeah. overcame it all. So he's saying, stop trying. Stop trying to do this. Stop battling this. This is not your fight. This is not your war. Just rejoice. You're, you're in it, but you're not of it. You're in this world, but there's something greater than you being in this world. I'm inside of you. Yeah. And I've already overcame it. So don't, have, you don't think that you have, this is not your test. This is my test, and I pass all my tests. Oh, Lord, I don't have any faith. That's all right. It says that when you are faithless, he remains faithful. This is one of the reasons why now more than ever, this is something the Spirit of the Lord keeps reminding me. Remember, remember, I've heard many times people say, you need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know who you are in Christ. You don't need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know who Christ is in you. Because as long as the focus is you, it, 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 eh. but when the focus is him, you know, good wine is good wine whether you put it in a, in a paper cup. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> you know, if you put it in a gop, it's very fancy, but it's the same wine. And what God is saying is, I don't care what vessel I'm in, I am still, I am still, I am that I am. I am still, I am still the one who silences storms. I'm still the one who says, Lazarus, come forth. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And so as, as, we, as we are um, nearing, it's amazing. Uh, recently I, I, I said, you know, this is going to be seven weeks and it's going to go by real fast. And here we are on the, on the seventh week. And it, it's amazing. I remember the, the, the time when if someone said, can, can you make a commitment for like a couple months? I'd be like, oh, that's a long time. But it seems like time is going by so fast. So fast. So fast. So here we are. This is seven of seven. And there's probably... Uh, uh, Am I hearing something? What am I hearing? Hey, what's going on back there? 
so, so we're, we're, we're on a fast-paced journey. There is no time to goof around. There's no time to be appropriate. There's no time to even try to be appropriate. So things are happening quick. Uh, things are happening fast. We're at the precipice of some amazing events taking. There's actually amazing events happening right now all over the world. Yeah. We're just very sheltered here, so everything seems okay. Uh, but th- we know that things are, are, are not okay. Things are unraveling. There, there are people with great, great power who have been under the guidance of some powers and principalities for thousands of years. You see, the humans are new, but the powers and principalities are the same. This is what we, we don't understand. And these things know more about the scripture. They know more about technology. They know more about anything. than, than like we, 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 are, we are nothing in comparison to the knowledge and the understanding that they have because these are entities who have been here since the very beginning, since Noah's day. Uh, and so it's okay that we're nothing. It's back to greater is he, greater is he, yeah. greater is he. Father doesn't need capable people. He needs available people. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So, so we're on a fast track, and we've been sharing a lot about understanding time so that we're not confused during these, the age that we're in. A lot of folks, as, as we said in the beginning, th- the end of the age, whenever you see eschatology, there's always a big question mark, and I've always hated that, because like, why do we have to stuck, be stuck on a question mark? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, when you understand the biblical calendar, when you understand God's calendar, you realize we're never on a question mark. Right now, we are exactly, exactly a little while before the people of Israel were told to celebrate Passover. So that's, what, that's where we are in God's calendar, preparing for Passover. And that's amazing. We don't have to figure anything out. Just though it's almost Passover. So we'll, we'll come and celebrate at the appointed time. Remember the, the sacred assemblies? Remember that from last week? The assemblies of the Lord? It's, the assemblies is not us assembling. The assemblies as, is meeting at the days that he said, these are my, these are my feasts. These are my sacred assemblies. And remember, if someone ever says to you, well, that's for the Jews, uh, no, the Lord didn't say these are the assemblies of the Jews. He said these are my sacred assemblies that you are to declare before my people from generation to generation to generation. And in one point, he says forever, which means even during the millennium kingdom, we're going to be celebrating the festivals of the Lord. In fact, in the book of Zechariah, probably don't have time to go there this evening. But in the book of Zechariah, the last chapter, 14th chapter, it actually speaks about what's gonna happen during the millennium. The, you know, Messiah comes, his feet are up on, mount, on the Mount uh, of Olives, the mountain splits, there's a big war because all the nations are coming to attack um, Jerusalem. And it says the Lord himself will fight, Judah will fight, angels will fight, and a lot of us, Maybe we'll be on vacation in Jerusalem at that time and we'll come out to the battle and war. And it says that the Lord will be victorious over all the nations. And then it actually says that many of the nations who came to fight against Israel, there will be survivors. And those survivors will go year after year to Jerusalem to learn about the festivals of the Lord. So, so, so we, might as well, we might as well get used to it, right? Start practicing. And as we know the festivals of the Lord, then we also know where we are in God's time. Because his, his, his clock is amazing. His timepiece is amazing. So time is going fast. We've shared quite a bit. And last week, we found out who's going to be taken. <laughs> <laughs> And apparently, none of you were taken, and that's why you came back. (laughs) Um, And sometimes I'm thinking, okay, good, that's out of the way, let's move on. And then all of a sudden, like throughout the week, I get all the calls, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, but wait a minute. I'm like, what the heck, I thought we got past this. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But there's always, 
but, you know, like you go one after another after another, you go through all these scriptures proving that what God is saying is the opposite of what most people have been taught, and then throughout the week you start thinking and scratching your head, and this is, but, 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 <laughs> and you know who says, but wait a minute, the first Adam. He's always a little concerned about that. The second Adam is like, yes, come on. <laughs> He's ready. Uh, so I did get some calls um, this, this throughout the week. And someone just like, you know, like they just grab a scripture and they throw a grenade. <laughs> and then they run away. <laughs> and I got to deal with his father, what the heck, you know. So, um, so uh, one of the ones I got was like, no, in the book of Revelation, the church is not there anymore. I'm like, oh, that's the problem. <laughs> the problem is our understanding of the word church has nothing to do with what's in the Bible because the word ecclesia, which is translated into church, was a Greek word long before Jesus even came into the scene. It simply means call out people or a gathering or a congregation of people. There was a place in the Acts where there was all these um, pagans and, and um, they, went, they wanted to attack Paul because they thought Paul came to mess everything up um, and there was like a big hullabaloo. This, this was a pagan temple and it says, and then finally they calmed down and, and they left and the translator said, well, we better not use that ecclesia word because that's not gonna sound right because these are pagans worshiping Baal. So they said, and then they dismissed the congregation. <laughs> it's the same word, ecclesia, but it wouldn't sound right, you know? And then, what do you mean, the church? These guys were pagans. They didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in anything. So the problem is when you hear church, what are you thinking? What do, when you hear church, what do you think? For God, God, right? So what was that? Christians, yeah, Christians, body of believers, right, people who believe in Jesus, church, right? Well, there's a little problem, there's a little problem, there's a little problem. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually, oh, let me, let me get my, <laughs> let, me, let me get this. Uh, all right, so, so this, okay, wait, 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 okay, so, so this church thing, when did this start, by the way, when, uh, I, like, Part of your understanding. When did the church start? Pentecost. Pentecost. All right, that's, that's a safe bet. Pentecost. <laughs> what is Pentecost, by the way? Oh, Shavuot. 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 What is Shavuot? Shavuot sounds like a Hebrew word, and it is. It's, it's weeks. It's 50 days after the priest takes the first fruits of the Passover, after Passover, and it waves them. They count uh, 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 seven weeks, and the day after the seventh week um, is, is the 50th day. 50 in Greek is penta, penta. So somehow that got thrown in there. So we're learning about the God of Israel through Greek terms. <laughs> Pentecost, yeah. So let's see what happened at Pentecost. Okay, I'm reading Acts uh, 2, chapter 2, verse 5. This, is, th this particular part I'm going to read is, is when uh, the disciples, the 120 believers had already had the fire put on their heads, okay? And then they're outside and everybody thought they were drunk. And then Peter starts speaking, and he's speaking to a group of people. So let's see if this is the birth of the church. It says here, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Do we understand what that means? So these are Jews, devout Jewish men, who actually lived in other nations and they came to Jerusalem. Why do you suppose they came to Jerusalem? The festival, the, 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 the assembly. What were they celebrating in this festival? What's that? 
Okay, wheat, yeah, the gathering, the, the, the wheat gathering, but that's a, there's a specific thing that happened in the Old Testament at this event, at this time. Ten commandments. The law was given, law, the Torah, God's instructions were given on Mount Sinai to whom? To Moses. For what people? For the people of Israel, the Jewish people. So these devout Jews came to Jerusalem to celebrate the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Okay? Uh, and it says, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. So these are Jews who came to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. They come to Jerusalem and they're confounded because there's one person talking but they're all hearing that person speak in their own language. Are there any Gentiles here? No. Not, no. not mentioned. As a matter of fact, the believers didn't know until later in the Acts that the kingdom was going to be shared with the Gentiles. This was a later event. This was when Cornelius gets into the picture. This is when Paul, I mean Saul becomes Paul and, and, and God begins to unveil like this is not just for Israel. This is also going to be extended for the Gentiles. And, and they're going to come in and get grafted into Israel and they will not be Gentiles anymore because when they come into Israel and they accept the God of Israel, they become part of the family. Yes. Does that sound to you like a church? This is a Jewish event. This is a Hebrew festival. These are Jewish people coming to, to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai you really think God is, is going to have the day of Pentecost happen when he's celebrating the giving of the law and that's when he's going to birth Gentile Christians who don't have to follow the law? What? Does, it, that does, does that even make any sense? This is ridiculous. So, um, so the day of Pentecost is actually, has nothing to do with the birth of any church whatsoever, not even the birth of a people. Uh, when is the birth of a bride? I'll give you a little hint. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. When was Eve birthed? When she came out of his side. He was put to sleep. For this reason, the man leaves his father and mother. Do they still have those around? I'm, I'm, like, I'm in like a crazy world right now. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cling on to his bride, and the two shall become one. Okay? So Eve is birthed when Adam is put to sleep, and for this reason, he leaves his father and mother to cling on to his bride, and two shall, the two shall become one. Well, that gives you a hint when the bride of Messiah was born. Not a, not, not a Pentecost, because Pentecost is the betrothal. Pentecost is the betrothal. If you have any Jewish friends, if they got married and you go around their house, you're going to see somewhere in their home, there's going to be a marriage ketubah. It's, the, it's in Hebrew. It's the Ten Commandments, and it has their name signed underneath and their rabbi. That's when Jewish people get married, that's their marriage certificate. Because the people of Israel know that when God brought Israel up to the mountain, it wasn't to birth a bride. The bride had already been birthed and he wanted to marry her. And he says, this is my betrothal. Will you marry me? So Pentecost can't be the birth. It is the betrothal. So if you go backwards a little bit before the betrothal, you remember there was somebody who was put on a pole and his side was open and he was put to sleep and he said, be, uh, John, behold your mother. He separates himself from his mother. Remember, my God, why have you forsaken me? He separates himself from the father. So at the moment that he's on the cross, he separates himself from his father and his mother so that his side can be opened and now the second Adam gives birth to his divine Eve. <laughs> Come on, somebody. 
And at that point, there, there's no Gentiles at all in this picture. None. It's, first of all, it's, it's a spiritual birth. We understand that. But even at that moment, there's no Gentiles involved at all. Remember, do you remember how Jesus treated Gentiles who came up to him to ask him for things? Remember that? Not, not a very nice guy. And he even said it. I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman says, yeah, I know, but you know what? <laughs> I don't have time. I don't have time to wait for Paul to get a revelation that the Gentiles are supposed to get grafted in. I got a little girl who's sick and dying. I don't care if you call me a dog. Even dogs can eat crumbs. I'll take the crumbs from this thing. I don't care what you call me. I just need some crumbs of what you have because I know if I eat some crumbs, my little girl will be healed. Sometimes, sometimes you got to move God's heart a little fast. God was not ready to deal with Gentiles, and that woman says, I don't care what you're ready for. I need it now. God is looking for a generation of people who, de- who demand because he says, I know my God. I know my God. I know my God. I know my God. Well, it's not, ta- it's not the right dispensation. Screw the dispensation. I need it now. I don't have time for a dispensation. I need it now. God is looking for a generation who says, no, 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 you don't understand. I know who my father is. I know who my father is. I, oh, I just thought about this. This, this, this funny story. We, <laughs> years back when we were still in Haiti, when we'd come back, um, uh, Michelle used to be so kind. She'd always let us stay at our house. She has a beautiful home. And, and we'd go in there, and, and, uh, and, and, the, and, and the room has its own little bathroom. Everything's quaint, beautiful, you know. So uh, I went in the bathroom, you know, I'm doing my thing, you know, and then I come out to the bathroom. And my glory is waking up, looking so beautiful. And I said, honey, uh, be careful. Like, if you need to brush your teeth or whatever, you have to do it in the shower because the sink is not working, you know? And, uh, and she's like, what? What do you mean it's not working? I says, I don't know, maybe construction, I don't know. Honey, trust me. <laughs> trust me. Sink is not working. But, but that doesn't make any sense. Michelle would have said something. I said, honey, you, please, come on, this is not complicated. That sink is not working. Just brush your teeth in the shower. Everything's going to be fine, right? She goes in there, and I hear click, 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 I don't hear the shower going, right? And then all of a sudden, she comes out, and she, she's like, hey, come over here. <laughs> so I go in there, and I don't know how the thing, like it's, you got to turn it this way, that way, and that way. And, and I'm like, what? How, 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 how did you get that done? And she said to me, she says, I'll never forget, she goes, I know Michelle. Ain't no way she's going to let us stay in a room that the sink ain't working. So this is amazing. That, that amazing little moment is, is, is knowing for me, if you know your father, if you know your father, you can say the same thing. I don't know what's happening, but I know my father. I know my father. This is what happened with Ab- Abram. Abraham, he goes up to the mountain, and God says, go sacrifice your son. And he says, I don't understand this, but I know God is my friend. I know he's my friend. He gave me a son at, my, at an age where I could not have any children. If he did that, I don't know what he's going to do, but I trust that he would not set me up. And that's what God is looking for, a generation who's on fire saying, I don't know what's going on in this world, but I know my father. Oh, you better wear a mask. You better do this. You better do that. You better get a vaccination. I don't know. I know my father. I don't know anything about Fauci, but I know my father. That I know. That I know. People will say, people will say to you, well, you know, you know, you, you, got, you got to vote for this guy or that guy. says, I don't know who's going to be the president. And I don't care. I know my father. And my father does not run in a kingdom that has a democracy. My father's kingdom is a theocracy. He says it, I say yes and amen. He declares it, I say, okay, father, whatever you say, not my will, but your will be done. God is looking for a generation that's not moved by what's happening in this world, but is moved by the heart of the father and say, father, I'm available. Whatever you need to say, use my mouth. Whatever you need to walk, use these feet. Wherever you need hands, use these hands. I am available and though he slay me i will praise him though he slay me i will praise him i don't do anything so god can favor me i do everything because i favor my father i don't do anything so god can favor me i do everything because i favor my father
I favor my father. Favor my father. Do nothing for myself. We're not here to do anything for ourselves. When you begin to realize that the Father has placed you in this world to minister to him, can you imagine that? God is like, oh, oh God, need, God needs a good message today. All right, Father, I'm available. What do you want to hear? We're here to bless our Father. We're here to put a smile on his face. If we live, we manifest him. If we die, we go be with him. What in the world is the problem? What are we worried about? What are we scared about? This whole, world, this whole world has been put through a test, a huge test, and guess, guess what? The body of Messiah has failed, failed, because someone says you gotta do something. Everybody go, oh, 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 oh. We forgot who our father is. We forgot who our father is. I was just on the phone recently with our, our, uh, the, some leaders in Haiti, and they're like, oh, okay. can, you find, can, you find, can you find some American families that can, uh, you know, Biden, Biden's got this program right now where, where Haitians can come to the United States and, and run away from the devastation of Haiti. You know, can you find some families that can take some Haitians? I said, no, I cannot find families in the United States that can take Haitians, but I know your father. You belong to a, fa- you don't need a family here to rescue you. You need to know what family you belong to. It's, it's, it's the warlords in Haiti that should be afraid of you. And what did we do? I got so sick and tired of getting all those calls. I said, all right, I guess we got to intervene here. So we spent eight days fasting and praying. And then, and then we had uh, 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 like, I don't know, two, three hours just interceding on behalf of complete strangers. Come, come quick. Come, come in a hurry. Come, come quick The Spirit of the Bride say come yeah. oh, Come, come quick come, By the way, I remember uh, um, as I was editing, one of the words that came out, it says, it says, the scripture says in Proverbs, it says, um, lift up your voice on behalf of those who have been set for destruction. Literally, God is saying, you're doomed, you're destroyed, and God is saying, where are my kids? You, is, is this, that's how you're going to roll? You ain't going to say nothing? Because you, your butt was set for destruction, and somebody said, Father, 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 not my will, but your will be done. If that's what it takes to save them, whatever, I'll do anything. Someone cried out your name and you're going to just roll like that? They're going to be set for destruction? Not going to say a word? Like, oh, well, sucks to be them. (laughs) You know, it's amazing. I remember saying that and after we said that, remember, lift up your voice on behalf of those who've been set for destruction. After we did that, that night, going around, praying, I mean, people went around seven times, and every time they went around, they stayed and wept and prayed and anointed each person. I mean, it was taking forever, but, but what is forever when you're children of God? Well, amazingly, after that decree, lift up your voice on behalf of those who've been set for destruction, I found out that one of the men that we were praying for has already died, but somehow he made our list. Somehow he made our list. In fact, he died two years ago. But he made our list, and all the people who came around and around and around and around and around to lay hands on that man, to pray for him and to anoint him and to ask the Lord to lift up a voice on behalf of a man who's already dead. Can I tell you something? You serve a king that has no problem kicking down the gates of hell and rescuing someone that you bring their name to the Lord because Jesus died for that man. He doesn't care where he ended up. We have the authority to cry to heaven and say, Father, I don't know what the plan is, but I know you're slow to anger and abounding in love. And I don't know why I get it and he didn't, but today we bring his name before the courts of heaven. His soul doesn't belong to him. His soul doesn't belong to Satan. His soul belongs to you legally because you laid your life down for him even if you didn't understand it. Oh my God. The power and authority that we have. The power and authority that we have. Amazing. Amazing. And the heart of God is so moved. It's like, all right, all right. 
I guess Jesus is starting to grow up <laughs> in, his, in, in my kids. Thank you, Father. So yeah, um, no, no, Pentecost is not the birth of a church. There was no church folk there. There was just Jewish people celebrating the betrothal. So the birth happened on Calvary. Now this will mess you up. I'm going to say it anyway. Well, Jesus died for the whole world. No, he didn't. He died for Israel. So you don't understand. You see, in Scripture, there, God, uh, uh, Revelation's progressive. It says, uh, in the beginning, there was a lamb for a man. This is Abel, who, who sacrificed. He was the first man to sacrifice a lamb. One man, one lamb. But God is not done with one lamb, one man. Now he brings you to another level. He, we go through the Exodus, and, and in the Exodus, it's one lamb for a family. One for a family. And if your family is not big enough, it's not just for your family. It's family and friends. Family and friends. One savior for family and friends. Then God says, let, 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 let me bring it up another notch. Messiah comes into the world. And it's one lamb for a nation. And in the book of Revelation, there's one final lamb for the nations, for the world. So Jesus is not the lamb for the world. Jesus is the lamb for Israel. I mean, Caiaphas said it. You know, when, you know, Caiaphas said, don't you know that it's better than one man die than a whole nation perish? He's prophesying without knowing. So Jesus came to die for Israel. Well, what about us? Welcome to the family. Because when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you are grafted in. So the salvation for the nation, you become part of that nation. Yes. You are one with him. And here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. Are you getting this? You're not a separate people. Do you understand that? You're, you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. Physically and spiritually, according to the scriptures. Um, uh, uh, it, the scripture doesn't say that, okay, you're Gentiles. It says you were Gentiles. But now you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. Because a Gentile is someone who doesn't know God. Someone who's outside of the covenants of the God of Israel. When you got grafted in, you became part of the family. So herein is the problem. If you were grafted in, you became part of the family. Then why in the world are people teaching that, oh, the true relation is not for the church? Because the church is going to be out of here. It's for the Jews. Oh, it really sucks to be a Jew, I tell you. Man, <laughs> what the heck? Like when we didn't keep his ways, we had to go to Babylon. And then we didn't understand anything, so Messiah dies. We say crucify him, so now he's all done with us. So now he has another group of people who don't have to keep his ways because they're not under the law, and they go to heaven. They get, but the Jews are still stuck here again. <laughs> what in the world? Let me tell you something. If the Jews are stuck here, so are you. Because God does not di di differentiate between a Gentile or a Jew in Messiah, we are one. Yes. We are one. We are one. So anyone who says, well, you know, the church is not in the book of Revelation, what are you talking about? If there's any believers on this earth, well, and we know there's, there's 144,000 from the tribes, don't you know that you're part of that? Don't you know that's a, a symbolic number? Everything in the book of Revelation is symbolic. That's not a literal number. It's a symbolic number. And, and you will be grafted into that number as well. You cannot separate yourself. You know, during uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Nazi um, regime that was going on in this world, there were believers, believers, Christian Gentile believers who put stars of David on their shoulder and stood in lines and went into the ovens because they said to those people, your God is my God. Your people are my people. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you die, I will die. They went into the chambers to be gassed, not because of their Jewish blood, but because of their spiritual blood the blood of Jesus, the blood of Messiah that makes us one. 
While they were doing that, there was another group of believers in church. You know what they would do when, when the trains would come by with all the screaming Jews? They would just sing louder because they hated to hear all that ruckus. And those are the same people who today would say, oh, no trouble's gonna come to us. We're gonna get beamed out of here. No, God does not have a plan for one group and a plan for another group. God has one people, one bride. He's not a polygamist. One bride, one people. Um, Let's look at Romans chapter two, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Did you get that? Anybody in here have their heart circumcised? Or at least daily or hoping that it happens? Then God considers you a Jew. Anyone here have the king of the Jews living inside of their heart? Yeah. 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 That's what he's saying. A Jewish person to God is not one who's on the outward. It's one that's on the inward. So if you have Jesus living in your heart and if your heart is being circumcised, you're just as Jewish as Abraham. Hallelujah. So, so, so for, 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 I don't want to say they're false teachers. I'm not saying that people who teach rapture are false. They're ignorant. For ignorant teachers who keep saying proof of the rapture is that there's no church in in the book of Revelation, there's only like the people of Israel, they don't understand. We are all people of Israel, we're all the same. God doesn't differentiate between anybody. He sees us all as one. Let's go to Galatians chapter three, verses 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through trusting in Messiah Yeshua. For all of you who are immersed in Messiah have closed yourself with Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. Are you catching this? God does not have a group of people who are gonna go do one thing and another group is gonna have to do something else. Are you catching this? We are one, we are one. In this oneness, we are the body of Messiah. God can't rapture his right hand and leave his left hand behind. That can, like he has one people, one body, one baptism, one faith, we are one. Jesus said, Father, I pray that they will be one. Right, he didn't say, I pray that they will be the church and Jerusalem, right? One, one, echad. I pray that they will be one. By the way, that, that word, ooh, hadapa, that word one is echad, it is the very same thing that in Genesis it says, and when, and when the man saw that the woman came from within him, for this reason the man leaves the father and mother, to cling to his bride, to, and the two shall become one. It's what God is saying, I pray that they'll be one the same way that Adam saw that that beautiful thing was part of him. It's God wants us to be one, understanding that, that you're part of my heart. I am part of your heart. When you're suffering, I am suffering. When my family in Haiti is suffering, I'm suffering. And if you think for a moment that what's happening in Haiti has nothing to do with you, I'm telling you right now, in two seconds, I disappear because I gotta go be with my family to make sure they're okay. 
and I can't return until I know they're okay. Because that's what fathers do for their children. You know, if you're working and you find out that your child is, is had in a bad accident, you, what are you gonna do? Oh, I'll, well, you know, when I get out of work, I'll come and check and see how you're doing, really? Oh, by the way, by the way, uh, Al, read that last verse, Galatians 3, verse 29. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Okay. Does anybody have that out? Somebody have that out? You do? Can you read it on your version? And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the Start again. And if ye... If Okay, okay, wait, wait, okay, wait, 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 hold on a second, okay? And if he be Christ, do you have an apostrophe there? Okay, that apostrophe doesn't exist. That was placed there, which makes it possessive. That apostrophe doesn't belong there. What it said was, if ye be Christ, Christ, if you be anointed, then you are the promised seed of Abraham. God is saying, see, see, the, the incorruptible seed came to multiply himself. So if the first seed was tomato seed, then you are all tomato seed. You are him. And so therefore the promises that were spoken to Abraham are for you because you are the multiplied seed of God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh la ha, my goodness this is amazing yeah that it um you see translators are limited by their understanding um it in the greek it says it literally says and if you be christos not christ's as in belonging to with apostrophe christos plural not Christians, Christians. As I've said before, Christians are humans who follow a faith, a belief. You, you, God didn't come live in you for him to follow the way you think. In, in Hebrew, follow means become. Become me, become me, become me, become me. It's amazing. So is that, is that clear? You can't go anywhere in the Bible and say, well, if there's a group going through the tribulation, that's not us, that's another group of God's people. That's the Jewish people. <laughs> if Jews are gonna be here during the tribulation, find a kippah, find some tzitzit, because you might as well blend in. You ain't going nowhere. Um, oh, you know, you know what someone said to me the other day? Rabbi, it says in the book of Revelation, and then, and then the dragon. <laughs> The dragon came, <laughs> and then, and then you know what happened? It says that that the woman, which is the church, was whisked away into the wilderness. <laughs> See? I uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but last time I checked, anybody going to the wilderness ain't a good thing. <laughs> Wait, am I the only one who knows that? The children of Israel had to be in the wilderness for 40 years. Were they dancing and singing and praising the Lord? Oh, praise the Lord. We done went, got whisked to the wilderness. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, it's a tough place to be. There's another mention about wilderness. Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted it doesn't sound like the wilderness is a very good place for the woman. So I agree. In the book of Revelation, the bride is going to go into the wilderness. But don't think that means you're going to... No, you're going to be in a wilderness saying, okay, God, now what do we do? Now what do we do? 
And you're gonna have to find hidden manna. And you're gonna have to have faith. You're gonna have to, your faith is gonna be built up. You're gonna begin to understand, why am I in the wilderness? Why am I, why, why am I going through this? You're gonna have to find out how Elijah was fed by the birds. And when that, when that ended up, how Elijah ended up going to a woman who had her last meal. God could have brought him anywhere, but he brought her to a woman who had a last meal. God is saying, I want you to go to the place that has the least ability to take care of you, and that's where I'm gonna take care of you. And not only did he go to get a last meal, but it wasn't a last meal because every single day she looked into her jar, and she had flour, and she had oil. God is saying, I don't care how bad it is, the worse it gets, the greater the glory. And he's looking for children and says, I'm just looking forward to manifest my glory, the glory of my Father. That's all I care about. No fear. No fear. No fear. No fear. You see, there's a, there's, there's a fake no fear. There's a no fear that says, I'm not afraid because I'm going to get whisked away. <laughs> well, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in big trouble. But then there are those who are walking on this earth saying, I'm not afraid because no matter what happens to me, not a hair on my head, which right now, you know, not a hair on my head will be harmed because my father holds on to me. This vessel is a temporary thing, is a temporary thing. As a matter of fact, this vessel is an earthen vessel and the earthen vessel connects me to the first Adam. In the beginning, the serpent has one head and it's skinny, and it's crawling in its belly. That serpent has been eating this flesh all the days of my life. This flesh is the first Adam which is made out of dirt. That snake has been eating dirt because God said, all the days of your life you'll eat dirt. She's been eating dirt since the very beginning at the end of the book. It is a dragon, why? Because it is fat from eating me up. And what is he eating? It's eating the dirt, and when all the dirt is gone, all that remains is Christ. (laughs) Next time someone says to you, oh, the dad was attacking me. Well, just give me a backside. Which part do you need? Which part, where is there more dirt in me that he needs to eat? Because the only thing he can eat is dirt. He cannot touch Messiah in you. That's right. And you know what? The harvest, this is another thing. The harvest is not gathering people who believe in Jesus. That doesn't make any sense. If, if you plant tomatoes, you harvest the tomatoes when the tomatoes have become mature. So you harvest what you planted. You don't harvest turnips that believe in tomatoes. You harvest what you planted. In this case, tomatoes. I mean, this is complicated. So therefore, God planted his son, the incorruptible seed, in this earthen vessel. So the harvest is not for me to go to heaven. The harvest is when this incorruptible seed in me grows into the fullness of Jesus and then he can harvest his sons and daughters, which are Christ on this earth. Hey, come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's, that part of us is never afraid it's the dirt in us, it's the, it's the first Adam in us that is so worried, what are we gonna do, what are you gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do, die, die. Yeah, that's all God is saying, no fear, no fear. So we're gonna go, oh Lord. Um, let's, let's look at the book of Revelation just to see a little bit of, of, of the generation is gonna be here, which may very well be us. I mean, we're, we're, we're at the door. We're right at the door. So this is talking about a lot of us here. Uh, uh, Revelation 7, we're gonna start at verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a vast multitude that no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues We're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Stop right there and hold that. It just identified who these people are. What, who are they? They're from all nations, all tongues. So that's not just Jewish people, right? Because the Jewish people are one nation. This is all nations, all tongues. Very important to understand this. Because these are the 
tribulation people that got slain. That's what he's talking about. So anyone who would say, oh no, the church is gone and, and those people who go through the tribulation are Jewish, this is proof that's not true. There's a lot of people in the tribulation who are not Jewish at all. They're from the nations. You can continue reading. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. uh, Hold that spot right there. They're holding something on their hands. Did you catch that? Palms, palms, okay, okay. I know someone's gonna say, but that's Palm Sunday. Uh, That's because no one told you that there's a time in the biblical festivals where the children of God are waving branches and it's not on Palm Sunday. It is on the festival of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the last festival of the, of the biblical calendar of the appointed times of the Lord. They have branches because they're celebrating Sukkot. Something, Sukkot is coming and they're getting ready to celebrate the last festival of the Lord. Which by the way, when Jesus was coming into the triumphant entry, they understood he was coming in as a king and that's supposed to be at the end of the age when they celebrate Sukkot. So the Jewish people of Israel said, I guess Sukkot's coming early this year. So they took branches and waved them because they thought Sukkot came early that year. That's why they did that. And it wasn't Palm Sunday, it was Palm Monday. That's the story for another time. Continue reading, please. And all the angels were standing around the throne, among with the, along with the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these dressed in white robes, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. Yes, Lord. The ones seated on the throne will shelter them. They shall never again go hungry Come nor on. thirst any more. The sun shall not beat down on them on. nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and guide them to springs of living water. And God shall wipe away every tear Come from on. their eyes. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see it? This is a multitude. This is a multitude that cannot be counted, made up of all the nations, Israel, people of Israel are there. It's basically all the people of God who go through the tribulation, and actually, they're greatly honored for having done that. If you've ever watched that movie, Left Behind, who gets left behind? people who don't believe, right? People who are unbelievers. And then there's a little group of people who are like, oh, I guess I should have been more faithful and somehow, and and someone would want you to believe that those weak believers are actually gonna be that group of people that are walking victorious through the tribulation? Are you kidding me? God is preparing a nation of people who are greater, greater than King David in this earth. People who know how to walk with the authority of God, people who have no fear for anything. I'm telling you, the kingdom of darkness cannot touch Messiah in you. He cannot touch Messiah in you. I don't speak things that I read in some seminary. I speak things that I've experienced in real life. When we were in Haiti, we were one time, we were speaking in front of 15,000 people and for some crazy reason, the pastor said, oh, the rabbi is here, let's get the demoniacs out. I'm like, oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) So there must have been 15 to 20 demon-possessed people just running around 
in the front screaming and their tongues spinning in their head and yanking hair off their heads. And I'm like, oh, Father, like I came here to awaken Messiah in people. I didn't come here to deal with demons, you know. Um, and so, but the people are running around. And I was like, Father, what, what, what do I, where do we even begin? You know, so many people, I don't even know what to do. And the Lord says, ah, get the biggest one, that one right there. <laughs> and there was this, this, uh, this, this lady, and she was <laughs> a lot taller than I. And, and she was going around, and she kept saying, or the, the spirit, the unclean spirit in her kept saying, Mue mangeau, mue mangeau, mue mangeau. She kept saying this. And what she was saying was, I'm going to eat you. 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 I'm going to devour you. And, and as she was going around doing this, there was a crowd of people around, and she was just coming. I remember hearing her teeth shattering like when a dog is trying to bite. And, and she's going around biting people, and everyone is running. Uh, and the father says, that's the one you're going to take. take. Um, and I said, okay, okay, father, but I have no idea what to do, you know. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, what, what do you mean to do? And, uh, and as she's coming around biting all the people, the people run away, and as they run away, I'm left in the center because the Lord is saying to me, I will not be moved. And I'm like, that's good for you, but I, I'm the one. <laughs> I'm the one who's stuck here, Father. Can I just kind of, can I go home and you go ahead and not be moved? Um, so I just stood there, and, and this, this, this woman comes, and the spirit just locked eyes with me and, and opened its mouth, and she's growling, came to bite. And I says, okay, Father, any moment now, because I don't know what to do. And the father says, now, stick your hand in her mouth. And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> what the heck? And I put my hand like this. And when I put my hand in her, her, her mouth opened up, and she could not bite my hand. And the Lord says, do not remove your hand from her mouth. Hold the back of her head and do not remove your hand from her mouth. So there we were for about 15 to 20 minutes rolling on the ground with me grabbing the back of her hair with the left hand and keeping my right hand stuck in her mouth. And she couldn't touch my hand with her teeth, screaming in agony. That there was no in Jesus' name. There's no I bind you. There's no I loose you. There always, all it was is Rabbi Peter with his hand stuck in the mouth of this Amazon woman, grabbing her beautiful little nappy hair, which was good because I really had a good clump of it's like, <laughs> it's like it's like wo- woolly hair, woolly hair, woolly hair. You know, you grab a uh, like you know. The, the, oh, she was not escaping that. And that was it. I didn't say a word. I didn't say the name of Jesus. All I did was the father said, stick your hand in her mouth. Do not remove it. it rolled around for about 20, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Finally, she stops. She sits up. She begins to vomit. And I feel peace come over her. She, her face changes, completely transform. And she looks at me. She had no memory of anything. She was weeping. She wanted to hug me. She, she, it's like she just got released after vomiting. Never once did I say the name of Jesus. Never once did I say anything that would make any sense. Never once did I take anointing oil and put on her. It was just grab the back of her hair, stick your hand in her mouth, and that's it. And when everything was calm, I asked the Lord, okay, can you explain what the heck just happened here? And the Father said, greater is he who lives in you. So you may think it's silly that you had your hand in her, but I live in you. And your hand in her mouth means that I was in that vessel. And that demon could not stay in her as long as your hand was inside of her because I live in you. The kingdom of darkness cannot touch Messiah in you. Amazing. So God is raising up a generation that's walking without fear and a generation that has no knowledge of what to do. They're just available. This is really important. If you went to some school for, for deliverance ministry, go get your money back. <laughs> Anything you've been taught, forget about it. You need to hear his voice at that moment and do what he tells you at that moment. Nothing can prepare you for this other than to just be available. So. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So 
um, are, are we okay? A, 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 have we stabbed this thing enough times or is it still quivering? <laughs> it's still like, Argh! Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, so so what it what it is is a scripture that that says uh okay, so Paul, let me explain it. So so Paul there is not talking about end time events. The the theme of what he's talking about he, uh, he was visiting some Gentile believers who had now become grafted to Israel. And Gentile believers did not know anything about resurrection. They didn't know anything about the afterlife. They didn't know anything. So they were having a funeral. And Paul was trying to encourage them. The theme of that particular chapter is Paul encouraging young believers to understand that death is not the end of everything. So the issue had nothing to do with end times at all. If you, if you read the whole uh, uh, chapter, you'll see the issue was they were mourning a dead person. And he wanted to encourage them. That's all he was doing. And as he was trying to encourage them, he said, I'm going to give you a mystery. We shall not all die or sleep in some uh, um, translations. Said, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. He's encouraging them. He's saying, death is not the end. Like your, your, your brother, your sister, your spouse, whatever, just died. I know it's sad, but it's not the end. Because we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And it says, for the Lord shall come down. So he's, he's encouraging them about things that they don't understand. The Lord shall come down. And, it's, and then he says, and those who died shall be resurrected first. They're actually gonna experience first. The, like we who are alive and remain will be gathered to, with them, but they will come first. And then he says, and then the Lord shall come down, and we who are alive and remain shall be gathered up with the Lord in the clouds in the air. That's what he's saying. That's what everybody wants to hold on. That's the rapture. Only one problem is, is the word he's using for air, are or are, I don't really know how to pronounce it, is the atmosphere. It's the only place in the universe that has that word is where we live. It's, it's, it's when in, the, in, in day number two when God separated the water from above to below it, and he created the atmosphere, which is what we breathe. He says we're going to get together with the Lord in this atmosphere. He's saying the Lord is coming and we're going to be gathered to him in this atmosphere. We're not going anywhere. And we know we're not going anywhere because it says, and, and, and thus we shall be with the Lord for how long? Forever. Forever. Okay, so... Okay, so he's coming, and we're going to be gathered to him in this atmosphere. We know we're going to be rain on this earth. So how, how could he go somewhere and then come back? There's nowhere to go. Because at the last trumpet, what we hear is a shout saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ, of his anointed. Where are we going? There's no place to go. So at best, I've actually seen this. I've explained this uh, uh, recently to someone Imagine if you're waiting for, for a, a, an old school friend that you love so much and, and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. You keep looking out the window and you're like, oh, I don't know when she's coming or when my friend is coming. You keep looking out the window and you're waiting, waiting with anticipation for your friend to come. And all of a sudden, now, because they're coming to your house, they're coming to stay with you. And you look outside, right? And you see that her car pull up. What do you do? You, you stay in your house waiting for them to knock and come in? What would you do? You run out to go hug her or him. And then where do you go? Come in. So if the Lord is coming and our bodies are changing, we have the ability to fly around, what do you think? We're going to stay here like, okay, can, can, can I come and hug you or should I just stay here? Of course you run to grab him, but you ain't going nowhere. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness they're in. There's only one, I'm telling you, there's only one, there's only one entity that wants you to believe that you're leaving. It's the one who thinks he owns this world. And he wants you to leave. He wants you to leave. Because as long as you're thinking you're leaving, you have no authority in this world. He wants you to think you have to leave. 
That's all it is. And it's nothing new under the sun because Nimrod, who was the first inventor of religion, was the first man who decided, let us build a tower so we can go into the heavens. This whole idea that humans have to figure out how to go to the heavens is a demonic teaching from Satan who wants you out so he can have rule and dominion over this place. Well, guess what? This place doesn't belong to him. This is why Jesus couldn't care less if he said, worship me and I'll give you this. He's a liar. So if he says, I'll give it to you, it means he doesn't own it. Are you catching that? Because he lies. See, a liar says, hey, you know, if you give me this, I'll give you that. As if he's implying that he owns that. He doesn't own that. He owns nothing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Oh, and by the way, the gold is the Lord's. And so is the silver. Just, just a side note. Oh, yeah. Just a side note. Father has it, has it covered. I, I just want to guess through, I just want to guess through um, this one particular episode in scripture because it's exactly a foreshadow of what we're about to enter into. Okay? And that is in uh, Daniel ch- chapter tw- uh, three verses thirteen, and we're just going to read through. This is amazing. This this is an exact foreshadow of what we're about to enter in this world. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to his summon. When these men were brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar responded to them, saying, "Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego?" that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden image that I put up? Now, if you are ready, all the moment, all the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, lyre, harp, and pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image that I have made. Okay, stop right there. Hold that position. Notice this. He's enraged. Because he just found out they won't bow down to the image. You do know in the book of Revelation it speaks that an antichrist is coming, he's going to make an image and force the people of this world to bow down to him or they're going to die. This is why you have to understand this test run that just happened in the past two, three years. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, what will they be willing to bow down to? Is it fear? Is it, what is it? If, if, and it's a, te- a test run to see what will you do if you're forced to. And anybody who says, well, when the Antichrist come, then I'll have faith, forget about it. Because if you can't handle a test, how are you gonna r- handle the real thing when you see your brothers and sisters having their heads chopped off, okay? So the king is furious. But notice that the king says to them, if you're ready, Let's bow down now. It's crazy. It's like the king is, is like, like the, the whole goal is he needs them to bow. He, he doesn't want to mess with them. He just needs them to bow. Change, like repent from your faith and bow. Continue reading. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be thrown into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Then what God will be able to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, saying, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to answer you concerning this matter. If it is so, our God, whom we serve, is able to save us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Yet even if he does not, Stop right there. Everybody is amazed that the boys were in the fire and then they get burned. That ain't the amazing part of the text. 
The most amazing part of the text is that verse where this says, even if God doesn't deliver me out of the fire, I am bowing down to your system. God is looking for a people who don't need, who don't need, who don't need God to do anything. It'd be nice if he does. It'd be nice if he does a miracle. It would be nice, but I'm not doing this to see a miracle. I'm doing this because I know my father, and I am bowing down to nobody but my father. That is the most powerful part of this message. That is the greatest part. See, see, we, we, we marvel at the fact that they didn't burn. Forget that if they burn or didn't burn, because to tell you the truth many have been thrown in the fire and many have burned many have been thrown to the lions and they've been eaten many have been decapitated many 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 and the truth of the matter is in the kingdom of heaven everybody who has spilled blood for the kingdom has an honor that nobody understands so God is saying, pay attention. The, 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 the amazing part of that story is not God's miracle. It's that these three boys simply said, God can do it, but if he doesn't, we ain't moving. Please continue reading. Yet even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your <laughs> gods nor worship the golden image that you set up. Set. Stick that up your pipe and smoke it because we ain't doing it. Got nothing to do with nothing. It ain't personal. It ain't like we don't like your statue. We don't like you. It ain't personal. It ain't because we're worried or not worried about the fire. All it is, our father. Our father is the only one we bow down to. That's it. What comes next, we don't know. But we know we ain't bowing down right now. You know, this kind of reminds me, one time I was teaching an a, a after-school program in, in Boston, and these kids were really messed up, and, and I told this one boy to sit down, and, and he stood up, and he looked at me, and he says, you, t- you touch me, you touch me, you touch me, you touch me, and see how fast my parents are going to sue you. I said, listen, your parents might sue me tomorrow, but today you're sitting down. I sat that boy down, I was like, oh, Lord Jesus, you was praying for Jesus. I don't care about your parents suing me tomorrow. All I know is you're going to sit your ass today. That's it. God is looking for people who says, I don't care what's going to happen. All I know what's happening right now. Right now I am bound down to this system. Continue reading. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage, and the appearance of his face changed toward <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times Stop hotter. right there. How many times? Seven. How many times? Seven. How many is the tribulation are we going to have? Seven. How many trumpets are going to sound? Seven. Sound familiar? Yes. Sound familiar? Yes. It's, it's the same thing. It's, God is saying there's a time coming you're going to be forced to bow down to a one new government, one religion, one world order, and when that day comes... You're going to have seven times, seven times hotter, seven times hotter. Seven. God is saying this is the same exact thing. It's, it's, it's bad enough they're going to throw me in the fire. They have to turn it up seven times hotter. Really? Really? Continue. Heated seven times hotter than it was normally heated and commanded some of the mighty men in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men, wearing their robes, tunics, hats, and other clothes... Stop right there. Who are these men wearing their hats, their tunics, their robes, and their everything? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mighty men. Uh, actually, so, uh, continue reading. You'll, you'll catch who they are. We're bound and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Okay, stop right there. So now we know who the men wearing these garments were. Right? Shadrach, yeah. Meshach, and Abednego. You got to catch this one. You got to catch this one. Wearing their clothes were bound. Wearing their clothes, they were bound. Wearing their clothes. <laughs> oh, fire away, oh, glory. <laughs> Is important. God is saying, You're not, you're not leaving your clothes. Nothing's happening. You ain't going nowhere. You're going into the fire with your clothes on. Continue. But because the king's order was so urgent and the furnace so extremely hot, a raging flame killed those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego fell bound into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and leapt to his feet. He asked his minister, Didn't we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Surely, O king. But he answered, saying, Look, I see four men working about. I see four men walking around unbound and unharmed in the middle of the fire, and the fourth has the appearance like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and, exchanged, and exclaimed, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the middle of the fire. When the satraps, administrators, governors, and royal ministers had gathered around, they saw the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their head was singed, nor were their robes scorched, nor was there a smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's edict, and to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I hereby decree that any people, nation, or language that says anything slanderous against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb, and their house made a pile of rubble because there is no other God that is able to deliver in this way. They turn one of the most evil kings into, <laughs> into a what, into a what? An evangelist, an evangelist, a pretty convincing one who says, if you don't believe in their God, I'm tearing your legs from them. He became an evangelist because these boys had no I'm going to leave you with this, this this evening. I was reading this one time and I said to the Lord, this is exciting, Lord. Look at the boys. Wow, so this is how it's going to be. In the end of the age, we're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Lord says, no. No, you're not going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That already happened. The end of the age, you're going to be a fourth one. We are the fourth one. <laughs> because the fourth one is Jesus. And where does he live? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs>